So, can I have your attention, please? Thank you very much. There are some seats scattered here and there around the room, so please feel free to find them. There are a couple up here and then in the middle and in the back, so you don't have to stand. So, good afternoon and very welcome to this afternoon's Estrad Lecture. Um, this is part of ESPRI's uh, work with uh, dissemination of research-based knowledge and we also work with our magazine on TRIA. If you haven't picked that up, I have it before, it's there at the entrance or exit when you leave. And uh, also please look at our website. We have over 100 lectures like this and other events and a lot of information there if you are interested in things around entrepreneurship, innovation and small businesses. My name is Magnus Aronson. I have the pleasure of being the managing director of Esprit and I'm sort of one of the inventories in the place because about 20 years ago I was standing on a different stage and uh, kicking off the first uh, open lecture in our open lecture series. And at that point we had one of the top scholars in the world come and do the inauguration lecture. That was Professor Bill Gartner. At that point, he was at the University of Southern California. And uh, now, many years later, uh, he's moved from the West Coast to the East Coast and is now uh, the Bartarelli Foundation Professor of Family Entrepreneurship in Babson College. So he also has an affiliation and a, like an adjunct professorship at Linnaeus University, or as we should say in Swedish, Linnaeus Universitetet. So, and it's such a pleasure, and think about this is the 191st lecture in this open lecture series. There have been over 23,000 participants over the years, so we are in the, in the business of knowledge dissemination, I must say. And if you think about also back 20 years ago, well, not all of you were old enough to think about what it was in the business community, entrepreneurship community, then it's a completely different how landscape today than it was then and I think it's also fun and sort of symptomatic to that that we are having this lecture here at sub 46 one of the hot spots when it comes to tech entrepreneurship in Stockholm so that just shows what has happened maybe just in the last 10 years uh, both in Stockholm and also Sweden the format today will be that Bill will talk for about well we'll see how long it goes uh, 45 50 minutes and then we'll open up for Q&A and we'll end with, with some possibilities for Mingle and, and some Fika. Um, I also want to acknowledge our main partners. We can offer these open lecture series free of charge, thank, thanks to uh, sort of funding from Tillväxtverket and Vinova. And we also have a media partner, Entrepreneur Magazine, in, in this endeavor. So. It's a true pleasure to have you back, Bill, and since then we've be become very, very good friends, and Bill's been back to Sweden several times, and uh, it's always a treat, and uh, he's uh, one of the, I would call, one of the avant-garde professors in this space. You never know what's going to happen, so I'm kind of nervous, but really thrilled to let him up on the stage. So, Bill, I will turn the mic on, and okay. you the can floor hear is me? yours, Bill. Okay. So... So I'm going to do a selfie with all of you, so, so my wife knows what I'm doing. She has no idea. She says, well, well, why are you in Sweden right now? Okay. And I better smile. Just a second. One, two, three. Thank you. Great. I can send that to her now. This is what I'm doing. Okay. Thank you for being here. It's unbelievable to realize it's been 20 years since this lecture series has happened. I was merely a boy. And um, so what, what I thought I'd do is just kind of, as you can see here, review kind of where I've been over 20 years, provide some highlights, but I want to quickly go through the slides because my joy is acti actually interacting with you. So I'm more in, into feedback and, and interaction. So I'll offer a few ideas and then hopefully that'll pique your interest on a number of things. I'm going to throw out some ideas and um, these slides will also be on your website. Okay. Because each slide has an idea, it has then a little descriptor, and then it has a usually two or three citations of research I've done to support the idea. Okay, here we go. Let's see how it happens. So, what am I saying? You can read that. 
So one of the things about entrepreneurship that gets a lot of people in trouble is, is that there's a feeling that entrepreneurs are different than other people. And because they're different in some way, then they must be different from everyone else. And actually, one of the things I think we need to realize about entrepreneurial phenomenon is it's vast. There's all kinds of entrepreneurs doing all kinds of innovative things in all kinds of environments. I cannot think of one industry where there's not some kind of entrepreneurial activity. I mean, think about this. Think about all of the automobile. I mean, you could say, oh boy, a stodgy industry is automobiles. But think about the innovativeness that's happening in the automobile industry. I know you have a showroom here, yes, for Tesla. So, automobile startup in this day and age. Okay. But you can think about any industry. There's been entrepreneurial activity across the board. So, it's just not high technology. Anything you can think of, someone's being innovative and creative and organizing in new ways. So there's lots of variation, okay? That I think to me is a really fundamental point and I started my career preaching that and it's been a real struggle because we all want to think that there's a special kind of person out there that's unique, that has these characteristics that no one else has and if we can just have that person, we'll be okay. But I would say we all have this capability of being entrepreneurial, it's a set of skills, really important to realize, okay. The other thing about entrepreneurship, it reflects the future economy, okay? And this is a big issue in the United States. I'm not sure what the statistics are in Sweden, but if you look at the proportion of the population, for example, that's involved in manufacturing, what percentage of the population, as you know, whatever you think about Trump, he wants manufacturing back in the United States. But how, what percentage of the population actually makes something in the United States that's involved in, give me a percentage. How much? Five. Any other guesses? So that's our anchor point. So then everyone's going to anchor off that. So many people are going to go below it and above it, but we're never going to get above 10. Yes? No, in manufacturing. It's less than 10% in the United States. And agriculture is less than 2% of the working population. So honestly, what if I came to you and said, we need to have more jobs in agriculture. There's no basis for it. And just the same in manufacturing. We're a service economy, okay? The knowledge economy is all about things that are not about the thing world. It's services and experiences. So one of the things too I think we fail to appreciate then is, is that the role of capital is, less, is therefore less about financing the manufacture and distributions of goods. Capitalism, frankly, means something different now than at what it was. But it's certainly not about financing stuff, okay? We just don't need that in our economy anymore, okay? So when you typically look at service jobs, there's a different kind of uh, scalability in how they work. They need way less stuff, okay? And they need much more of this. So this becomes the crucial part, which I think is the next slide. Education and entrepreneurship. Um, this is the one thing I tell public policymakers. If you want an entrepreneurial economy, the way you get it is through education. A rising tide raises all boats, okay? And education is the major driver of that. We did a major study in the United States, basically from 1997 on, where we tried to find people that were starting businesses and we looked at who those individuals were in relationship to the rest of the population. And what we found was, is that it was nearly, so if you know how statistics are, a point, 1.0 is perfect correlation between something else. And if you, what we found for education was, is that the correlation between levels of education and entrepreneurship was a point 0.9, okay? Which meant that the more education you had, the more likely you were to start a business, okay? The most entrepreneurial group in the United States actually happened to be African American men who had PhDs, okay. 25% of those individuals were starting companies, okay. The highest rate of any, any demographic group in the United States. So the, the, the critical aspect for me on this is that it's the one lever that I think society can really move if they want more entrepreneurial activity. Educate everyone. And frankly, what our data showed is it doesn't matter what it's in. 
Okay? It doesn't have to be in engineering or computer science. It can be in any kind of level, but the more intelligence someone has, the more knowledge they have in their heads, the more likely they can be innovative. So your country is spending a lot on education. Yay. Okay. It's really key. It's really key. That's why I like the Scandinavian countries. I think you're really, really smart about how you play this out. Educate people, you're more likely to have an innovative and entrepreneurial economy. But then there's this other aspect that's highly correlated to entrepreneurship. Wealth. Okay. So this is what we know. Higher levels of wealth are correlated to higher levels of entrepreneurship. Okay. Why? Well, it's easier to start a business, sustain efforts to get into business, and grow to business if you have financial resources. So actually, we've just finished a study that's not a part of this because it's in review that indicates that in the United States, as you know, wealth is really bifurcated in the United States. We have lots of poor people, and then we have a lot of rich people. Okay, and the middle class is kind of diminishing. So if you look at the quartiles of wealth and how that works, it's quite largely distributed. So one predictor we found is, is that if someone has $300,000 of wealth, so they've got that much in wealth assets, the likelihood that they, they'll be able to start a business and maintain it, actually get into business, is 30, 30 times, 30 times higher than someone who has less than 10,000 in assets. Okay. So wealth actually makes a huge difference. If you have money, because think about it, if you've got money, you can make mistakes, right? You can lose some of your assets, you can continue on, you can pay yourself to be stupid about how things are working. So wealth makes a difference. But obviously, we can't just give everyone $300,000. Or maybe we can in the United States if we were to tax wealthy people, which we don't. Okay. But, so, but there's an irony. So wealth matters, actually. It's an important way for people to actually get into business. And we can certainly see this, uh, see this around the world as well. One of the hot topics has been, um, and I, I think you've had, have you had Giannis here? Didn't he win the Nobel Prize in economics? So here we have... Giannis of Grameen Bank in India, his genius was to basically provide wealth to really poor people, and it makes a significant difference. So having assets, having some kind of wealth makes a big difference in entrepreneurial activity across the board. Give people money, they're more likely to be entrepreneurial. Okay, but we know this is true as well. But not having wealth doesn't prevent people from getting into business. There are substitutes for wealth. Okay. If you have human and social capital, which means human capital is your knowledge and skills, and your social capital is your connections to other individuals, that makes a big difference. So you can substitute human and social capital for wealth. But obviously, it's, it's nice if you have a lot of money. Okay. So as you can see, I'm going through these slides quickly because I want to take questions and have some interaction. Um, a lot of my career is built on this. Motivations don't matter, okay? And the more empirical research I've done this, the more I believe it to be true. Entrep the reason entrepreneurs get into business are the same reasons that people get jobs, okay? So when we compared the group of entrepreneurs we had to the general population, well, lo and behold, we find that people who get jobs and people who start businesses all want self-realization. They want to do something that they really enjoy. Everyone wants to do okay. They want financial success. Everyone wants to be innovative and intrigued, and everyone wants some kind of independence in their lives. Entrepreneurs actually scored lower in the United States than people who were seeking jobs on these four variables. But it wasn't statistically significantly different. Okay, So uh, entrepreneurs aren't... aren't are not different on the reasons they start businesses. Okay. It's not about motivations. Okay. Entrepreneurship is a kind of a career. It's something that people do. It's like, if I'm trained as a doctor, what do you think I'm going to spend my time doing? Probably going to do doctoring, right? Whatever medicine of some kind. Okay. So if I'm, so my, my bet is if I train people to be entrepreneurs, what are they going to spend their time doing? Doing entrepreneurial things, right? If I train a whole bunch of people, did I just see this new movie, Bjorg, on Bor 
Didn't that just come out here? It's not in the U.S., but I've been seeing that. So, why do you have so many great tennis players? Are, is it kind of like, were they, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how they're going to play this out in the movie. Is it because of like, there was like 10 really great world-class people that were born to play tennis? Or was it that one of the things that Sweden did is they built a lot of tennis courts and they had a lot of kids play tennis and some of them were better than others and as they competed, the good ones rose to the top and were able to play other good players that had been trained at other places and played. Okay. So if you train, train a lot of people to do certain kinds of things, they're more likely to do it. If you train people to be entrepreneurs, they'll be entrepreneurs. Some will be better than others at it. My aphorism for this actually is, I, and I hope it's not too stupid for you once you hear that. Do you know who Mozart is, the composer? Nowadays, it's hard to know whether anyone knows any classical music anymore. But my aphorism is, Mozart was not born to a family of woodcutters. Okay. So think about it. If you know Mozart's life, he was born to a family of musicians, right? Everyone in his family played music. No wonder he had some likelihood then of being a musician and being a composer. But what if he'd have been born to woodcutters? Do you think we'd have Mozart? Uh, he'd know how to cut wood really well. Maybe it would sound kind of toony, but he would be a woodcutter, okay? So we have to think about where we put our intellectual assets. If we put it in things like entrepreneurship, then we get more entrepreneurs. If you put it into tennis players, you get more tennis players. Put it into doctors, you get more doctors. So where are we putting our intellectual assets? So to me, it's less about motivations. It's much more about skill orientation. People do kind of what they're trained to do. Motivations don't matter, okay? We all want to do well in our lives, okay? Risk. Risk is another aspect of this entrepreneurship that I think gets distorted. So, perceptions of whether the outcomes of entrepreneurship are more or less uncertain does not appear to affect whether an entrepreneur successfully starts a business or not. So, if you look at the profile of, risk, of entrepreneurs as risk takers, it's vast. Yes, there are individuals that are that just like thrive on risk and want to do the most risky things known to mankind. But there's also a lot of entrepreneurs that will take no perceived risk at all. They're hugely risk averse. So the population of entrepreneurs in terms of risk taking profile looks like the population of everyone else in the rest of the world. It, so risk is not a key aspect of the entrepreneurial phenomenon. Some people choose risky deals, some people don't. But also there's ways to manage that process. Okay, so I find for the most part that entrepreneurs, well, think of it this way. If you were, if you were told that you needed to, to be a trapeze artist, that tonight your job was to get on a trap, you know, a trapeze is the swings that go back and forth and you get on it and then someone's going to catch you. And you were told that tonight you were going to have to perform a double back flip. Okay, that's your future. You're going to get on a trapeze, do a double flag flip, and you'll get paid to do that. Is that risky? Well, probably it is to you because you've never done it before. So you perceive that experience and go, well, you're ignorant of how it works. You've never been on a trapeze. You've never done a double flip. You've had no training or experience in it. That would be risky to you. But what if you've been doing it for 20 years? It's just like getting outside and taking a bus. Is that risky to take the bus? Probably not. Okay. So risk then is also a perception of your own skill level. Okay. And most entrepreneurs have some set of capabilities that are different than maybe what I have. So their situations are less risky. So it's not about risk. Okay. What matters in entrepreneurship? I, be I believe this. Do more. And I, I kind of started my career based on all of this stuff. Getting in the business is the result of action. People who get into business do more. They spend more time and effort in the process and they engage in more activities. One of the problems with Americans, and maybe you've gotten this kind of from our political process, is, is that they talk a lot and do nothing. Okay, So Americans like to talk a lot. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're prone to action. So there's a lot of people that talk the entrepreneurship game. In fact, actually, this is typically what we say in the United States. If someone's unemployed, usually they say, if you ask an unemployed person, well, what are you doing? They'll say, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. Okay. I'm starting a business. Okay. So that's a sign of unemployment, really. Oh, yes. Oh, you're an entrepreneur. Well, that means you don't have a job. Okay. Um, but entrepreneur, entrepreneurship involves action. And, for example, one predictor of it is, are you spending more than 30 hours a week actually starting your business? Huge differentiator. Okay. And know this. Most entrepreneurs who are starting a business in the United States actually have a full-time job. Okay. So that's also a strong predictor. If you actually are employed, you're more likely to start a business. So think about it. You have a full-time job, and you have to work 30 hours more a week in order to get into business. Okay. So you have like a 70 to 80 hour week work. Okay. And it's a set of actions. It's not just, oh, I've been thinking about this business for years and years. Okay. So it's effort along the way. Action makes a huge difference. Okay. Oh, another piece on that. So there's a, I don't have this graph here, but uh, typically we, when we've studied entrepreneurs over time, so it, on average it takes about two years to get into business. Okay, 24 months. 24 to 36 months is the average amount of time it takes. If you look at activities over time, what you find is there's three kinds of people out there. There's people who get into business, they do a lot of stuff, and it kind of goes up exponentially. Then there's what we call the quitters, and there are people that actually quit the startup process. And if you look at the quitters and the people who start the businesses, for the first two years, quitters and starts look exactly the same. They do the same amount of work. Okay. But frankly, my feeling about people who quit the startup process is they go to a point and realize, this is not going to work anymore. And no matter what I do, I must stop. And they do. Okay. So the only way you'll find out whether you should stop is to do enough work to know that it won't. Okay. Or you're going to get into business. And then there's a third group. So people who get into business, 30% of the, of, of the people who start businesses. People who quit, about 40%. And then there's another group. We've got 30% left. And we call them the still trying. And there's a group of individuals that basically don't do anything. But when you call them on the phone over five years, they'll just say, oh, I'm still trying to start my business. I know I haven't done anything, but I'm still kind of working on it. Okay. How much time do I have? None? Have plenty of time. I just Please talk a little bit more about, are there any specific actions they are doing that makes a difference? No, it doesn't matter. That's the weird thing. Just do a bunch of stuff. I mean, it looks like flailing around. I mean, it, it sounds weird, doesn't it? It's like, ah, oh, I don't care. Just get out there. But part of it is, it's a, oh, so another one of my taglines is, you know, social entrepreneurship is a big thing, right? You know, we want to all, but I can tell you this, all entrepreneurship is social. The one thing that differentiates entrepreneurship as a, as a creative activity compared to any other activity is entrepreneurship involves other people. It's part of a, the transactional economy. In order for me to be an entrepreneur, I have to be involved with other people. It's not like I, if I'm a painter, like in my painting life, I can paint alone. I could be Van Gogh. I could paint for the rest of my life and not inter interact with anyone else. So he's not an entrepreneur, okay? He's a painter. He's an artist. He's a creator. Entrepreneurs always interact. Okay? Organization creation always involves other people. So it means you have to get out of your house, your business, wherever you are, and interact with other people because there's always an exchange relationship involved. I, I tend to study for-profit businesses, but those are businesses where someone takes money out of their wallet and they give it to you as an entrepreneur. There has to be that transaction part. So there's lots of things you need to do. It's kind of multifaceted. Frankly, anything you do. I mean, this was the weird thing, too, because we thought, God, isn't that weird? Just do a bunch of stuff, but, but just do a bunch of stuff. Because most people don't. Most people don't do anything. They just say they're doing stuff, but they're not. They're kind of in the coffee shop, reading a magazine, goofing off. They're on Facebook. 
Oh, that's my next slide. That's my next slide. <laughs> Plan. So there's this, this is probably the most controversial sl slide for academics up here. And, and a good colleague of mine, Paul Reynolds, despises this idea. But, but, but I want to frame what planning is. So Paul, Paul Reynolds has basically looked at the same data set I've looked at it and said, all planning does is predict that you will quit faster than other people. Okay, but, but here's how I'm going to define this. Entrepreneurs, for the most part, have a keen sense of what the path to success will look like. And even though they realize there might be, due to, even though they realize there might be detours along the way. So planning is the scout's motto. And I, and I brought my scout tie. I was going to wear it, but it's too hot. So, so this, is the, this, is the, this is the scout tie. All the, there are secret signs in the scout tie. So if I'd have worn that, and you would have come up, and if you were a scout, you would have said, oh my God, you're a scout. That's why you said be prepared. So here's the challenge with planning. Is, is that, uh, another aphor aphorism. I think entrepreneurs are adaptively persistent. Okay. So they have a goal in mind. They move forward with where they go. That's typically resented, represented by a business plan or some document that outlines where they want to go. But they need to be able to adapt as things change along the way. And that's kind of where the challenge of business plans are, is that I, I think they're tremendously of value. O only because if you're doing, okay, and there's an, let's say this too. A business plan is a document that represents, in my ideal world, a set of activities that people have done in order to create the document. Now it's possible to create a document without doing any of the activities, okay? If that makes sense. So for example, I could do a market study and not talk to anyone about my product, okay? And then I could just make stuff up and put that in the plan. But in, in my world, the ideal world is I've, so I can actually tell you, this is about doing stuff. I've made a bet to everyone and I've never lost, lo I've lost a lot of bets, but I've never lost this one. So this isn't one of the slides. There's a scholar in, at the University of Chicago named Ronald Burt. His idea of entrepreneurship has to do with the idea of structural holes. That what entrepreneurs do is, is that people are networked in different kinds of ways and there's holes between networks. And what entrepreneurs do is fill the holes. The easiest way to think about it is someone has a bunch of apples. They have apple trees, okay? And then there's a whole bunch of people living in town that want to eat apples, okay? So there's a hole there bunch of apples, people who want to eat apples, but the person here can't get to the person here. The entrepreneur is the market maker. They kind of bring the apples from the orchard to the people who want to eat the apples. There's value added out that way. So invariably, if you, do I have any more time? I, I've got plenty of time. So I'll give you an example. So a structural hole could be is, if I'm an, on, so this is what entrepreneurs do. Let's say I'm going to start a medical manufacturing company. What do I need? I, and I've had four of my friends do this, and I should have done this too. They've all become really, really wealthy. Not me. Because I haven't pursued this idea that I keep telling them. So I'm an entrepreneur, and I know nothing about medical equipment manufacturing. And it's one of the easier things to get into. It's high value. The FDA, the government agency that regulates equipment, does it in a different way than anything that actually goes into the body. So I need ideas, okay? So where do I go for ideas? I go to, so this is a friend of mine. He started actually a business. My original degree is from the University of Washington. They have a big medical center. He goes to the center, walks around the halls, talks to doctors, gets ideas for medical equipment. Okay. Then he needs, he needs someone to help him make it. So he finds out who medical equipment manufacturers are that could basically manufacture things for him. He also needs to talk to people who have money so he can finance the manufacturing of all this medical equipment. So he makes, he connects up with those individuals. He needs manufacturer's representatives that once he makes the equipment and it's licensed, it can go out and sell to other doctors and to universities. So the structural hole is, is that I can be a doctor and have an idea, but it doesn't mean that I have the capability of making it, manufacturing it, selling it, designing it, doing any of that. I can sell medical equipment, but it doesn't mean that I have ideas for new medical equipment or that I have the resources in order to take that medical equipment and make it work. 
So what entrepreneurs are is they're in the middle. They're filling that hole of the connection between ideas, capabilities, who's going to sell, markets, all of that. That's the hole they fill. Okay. So my bet to students in my class is if you have an idea for where you want to go and you talk to 250 people, so that's a stranger a day, about your idea and where you want to build your business. So that's 50 weeks out of the year, two weeks off for vacation. You can take those whenever you want. If you talk to 250 people, you'll be in business in a year, or I'll buy you lunch anywhere you want to go. Most expensive restaurant you can imagine anywhere in the world. I have never lost that bet in 30 years. Never lost that bet. Every student who's really done that has gotten into business. It doesn't, again, because it's, again, what it's about is filling a structural hole. It's making connections to all these individuals that you need in order to make your business work. Entrepreneurship is a social process. It's involving others in what you do. That's where the creativity is. It involves others. And if you do that, things will happen. So planning is basically providing some kind of direction for where you want to go and having some sense of where the potholes might be along the path. Okay, but it's not a guarantee that you'll be successful. But I, I still have people figure out their business model and tell me whether they think they can make money doing it. And do they have anyone who wants to buy it? Okay, so part of the plan is, have you identified anyone who wants what you have to sell? Show me that person. I want to meet them. I would like them to give you money. I would like to see that happen. Then we know. It's not a fantasy. It's just not all talk. So planning makes a difference. So preparation, I think, has real value. I know a lot of entrepreneurs that are just tremendously... So if you're not prepared, then you must be lucky. Okay? You have that option. So that's an option available to you. If you're a lucky person, bless you. The life is open to you in wonderful ways. You will do what you'll do, and Godspeed to you. Okay? But, you know, if you're, you probably aren't that lucky. Okay? So then you better be prepared. Okay. Okay. So this is kind of more of an academic one. And it rhymes. In order to see, increase your vocabulary. So the language we use to talk about entrepreneurship both constrains and enlarges how we think about what entrepreneurship is and how it occurs. So in one of the problems of academics is we get ourselves into kind of fashionable language and then the language really hurts us. So um, the language that I'm not happy with right now is the language of opportunity. So are you pursuing an opportunity or not? Okay. And are you discovering that opportunity? Are you creating that opportunity? And there's dozens, if not hundreds of academics that are involved in this dispute about whether opportunities are created or discovered. Okay. So that's a kind of a set of language about the nature of the phenomenon. And I can tell you that all of that constrains how we think about what's going on. I think entrepreneurs just do a whole bunch of stuff because it's a lot of fun and interesting to them. Sometimes there might be something called an opportunity, but usually there's not. They're just having fun. Okay. So when you ask an entrepreneur, what's your opportunity? It makes them have to think about what they're doing in a way that's not really true to who they are. Okay, and did you discover it or did you create it or all of that? So academics, there's thousands of person hours are involved in thinking about that and it's stupid. Did we get that on tape? It's stupid. Okay, we'll put that on the internet. Um, so we can think about the language you use in very different ways. And I think one of the geniuses of what entrepreneurs do is they invent new language for the nature of what they're trying to do. I think you've had Sarah Sarasvathi here. Okay. So you may be familiar with the word effectuation and the whole process of that or bricolage. So those are new kinds of words to talk about how people pay attention to their own situation. They co-create with others, use the resources that they have in new and novel ways. So both bricolage, Ted Baker's idea, and effectuation, Sarah Sarasvathi's idea, both those came from entrepreneurs. They were paying attention to what was actually happening in reality and then just merely mirroring back that in terms of where academics were. So, so this is to the academics in the room. 
So my, my belief about entrepreneurship is, is that our job is to pay attention to what entrepreneurs are actually doing. That, that, that's our responsibility because they're really the innovators and actually they're linguistic innovators. They're, in order to, do I even say this? Maybe it's on the next slide. So we see through vocabulary, we see through the words we use. So that's to me really, really key. That I, we have to invent new language to talk about the phenomenon. Okay. And this will end up probably with my last slide and then I'll take some questions. So what is entrepreneurship then? To me, I've kind of expanded it. My, I, I actually just study people starting businesses or organizing in particular ways. But we can define entrepreneurship as creating the future. So with that, imagination is the primary requirement for engaging in this activity. And there's some interesting research coming out about how that process plays out. But to me, that's the key part of it. And I'll link imagination to vision. So the root words for vision in the English language are to see. So what entrepreneurs do is they're creating an ability for people to see the future and live in it. Okay, and that's how the future happens. We step into it, okay, and that's what entrepreneurs do. So um, I'll end there, and I figure that will prompt some questions from, from you, and then we'll go from there, which to me is the more fun part. But, but before you do that, uh, we'll just close that. And, and there's a couple other things we talked about uh, earlier today that I think would also interest you that you didn't have any slides to address and there are three things. One to talk about your farm, family entrepreneurship take because that's and then the importance of humanities for entrepreneurship and then about uh, the role uh, the depiction of entrepreneurs in films and books as I know you've done ah. quite interesting work on. Okay, I think that be quite families Families, humanities, narratives. Films and books, narratives. Okay. It kind of rhymes. Um, so for families. So m my background is not in family entrepreneurship, obviously. So if you know my background, the first question you'd ask is, so why are you doing family entrepreneurship um, at Babson? And to be honest, I've been intrigued with a whole bunch of things. One is... Uh, What intrigues me is different social aspects about the nature of entrepreneurial phenomenon. Again, all entrepreneurship is social. Okay, so then we have to ask, how does that phenomenon occur in, relate, in the relational world? And family business has tr traditionally been about families that own businesses. And when you look at the research, mostly it says that be businesses, that since most of these programs are in business schools, they look at the business and they find that Family businesses underperform other kinds of businesses. Okay, so being a family business is awful because they underperform. That's because business is de the dependent variable. But what if we flipped it? So to say family business is really about families who happen to own businesses. And businesses are merely a means to an end. So it's really about optimizing the family as a social role rather than the business itself. So that's been fun to play with. We're trying to figure out how to kind of do some research on that because if you take family as the primary role, a couple of things happen. Almost everyone who's, so this is all well, just tied into films. Have many of you seen the film Joy? It's about a woman who, who mops, who creates a mop and she becomes a multimillionaire because she invents a new kind of mop. Well, that's an interesting film because it's basically about the problems of starting a business with your family, okay? Do, who in the family supports her? Who doesn't? Who is an enabler? Who is a disenabler? But if you look at anyone who starts a business, they're socially embedded, right? In all kinds of relationships. And what would be the primary relationship? Family. Um, I did a, I think I can talk about it now because this was in the 90s. I, I did a proprietary study for a, an outplacement firm called Lee Heck Harrison that basically was involved in outplacing all the white collar workers that have been fired in the 90s. So I had a huge data set on, because their concern was, if we're firing all these white collar workers, it was the first major letting go of all of these executives in the United States, and every, all the companies are doing it, there's not kind of a lot of ways to place white collar workers with other firms who are also letting white collar workers go. 
So what are we going to do with all these people? Oh, we're going to make them into entrepreneurs. So I did a fairly long study on what predict whether a white collar worker would become an entrepreneur. Okay. What were the major predictors of that? And the, it's basically an inflow outflow thing. It had to do with how much money you had coming in and how much money you're going out. So you could never be an entrepreneur in the United States if you had kids in college because it costs a lot to, it's not free like it is here. It costs you a lot of money. Okay. So if you had kids in college, not going to happen. If you had expensive cars on lease, not going to happen. If you had a big house you had to pay for, not going to happen. You needed to get a job. So you couldn't have a lot of money go out. But also you needed to have money coming in. And the predictor of that was working spouse. You had to have a working spouse because in the United States, healthcare is not free. Your spouse, someone in your family has to have a job that pays for healthcare. Probably it sounds strange for, to you that that's the way it is, but it's the way it is in the United States. So working spouse was the major predictor of getting into business. Without a working spouse or with, without a huge pile of money as savings, wealth, you couldn't do it. So I'm kind of coming back around now to say, you know, we've got an interesting social role called the family. Let's look at how families act entrepreneurial. Well, we know, for example, one of the hot topics in entrepreneurship is entrepreneurial teams, right? Teams. What's, what are 50% of all entrepreneurial teams in the United States? Spousal pairs, okay? Hello? Okay, so that's the primary team. This, your spouse, okay? But we don't necessarily see that in the literature emphasized, and we certainly don't see it except for joy. We don't see it in the media very much about the fact that most entrepreneurs always have a family supportive network around them, and it's hugely predictive about whether they'll do well, okay? So families make a difference in entrepreneurship. So I'm trying to play that in the entrepreneurial uh, arena of Babson. It's trying to push family entrepreneurship, but also how do they act entrepreneurially over time? I think one of the challenges, which certainly I'm talking to the entrepreneurial families at Babson about is, is that entrepreneurial families, families that are passing their business on from one generation to another, we need to use this word. They are unicorns, okay? Because let's look at how entrepreneurship plays out. We know already that only 30% of people who try to get into business get into business. Of those people who get into business, after 10 years, 90% will have failed, okay? So someone who has a business that's lived long enough to be passed to another generation, that's a unicorn. They're rare, okay? It's certainly a significant problem if you have a big business and you've got lots of assets and you want to reconfigure and act entrepreneurial, but it's not very many businesses that exist anywhere in the world, okay? So family entrepreneurship. Humanities, um, I think we learn through stories, and this will get into narrative. I think we learn about the process of entrepreneurship and the kind of pitfalls and the ways that entrepreneurship happens through the stories we tell about it. So I'm very sensitive to how that plays out in our culture. So for example, here we have Joy. It's a story of a woman entrepreneur, and it's frankly about her family and all the hassles about it. Then we have another film called The Social Network about Zuckerberg. Is there one bit about his family? No, not at all. Now why is that? Is it a guy thing? Guys aren't interested in families. They don't have relationships. That's not a problem. Huh. Um, have you seen the film Steve Jobs? Okay. okay. The, the fictional one that was written by the same person who wrote The Social Network uh, what was his name who wrote The Social Network? Anyway, the same person who wrote The Social Network also wrote the film on Steve Jobs. And the interesting thing about the Steve Jobs movie is that's a, actually a story about families, okay? It's an interaction with his daughter over time, his wife and his ex-wife, how all that plays out, okay? So it's interesting to see how these things get, get formed in terms of who's important or not. I'm actually doing a study right now where we're looking at people talking about their startups. And the title of this article is called, uh, um, part of it's called Significant Others. But if you look at transcripts or people talking about how they start their businesses, what I'm finding really curious is 
who do they mention as a part of the startup process? Do they mention their significant other, their spouse or partner? Do they name them? Who do they name in the stories? Like, for example, every business at some point has to have a first buyer. Someone has to make that sale, right? Do they name that person or is it just the buyer? Okay. First employees, are they named? Who is named and why are they named? Who's significant in that story? And I found it very powerful to look at stories across time, particularly because now you may be from, has Elaine All spoken here too, probably? At, at some, some point. point. So Elaine All, who's at, who's at Yon Shoping University, is basically doing gender studies and entrepreneurship. And one of the points that she makes in looking at entrepreneurial stories is, is that men tend to never talk about women. Okay? There's a classic story that I had her analyze. An entrepreneur talks about the startup of a business. Basically, it was two spousal pairs that, were, that had started the business, two men, two women. The women were actually running the business. In Terry Allen's story, the men had names. In fact, all of the men had names. There were women across this whole process, both the spouses. They were never named. They were just the wives. Okay. But they were running the business. It's nuts. Okay. But we have, so we have these cultural aspects and how we talk about things, how we recognize what's important that I think are really worth paying attention to. So I'm very interested in how those stories get played out, who we emphasize or not who we celebrate and why we celebrate them. So that's where I'm going with the humanities, is to think about stories and what they mean. So in family business, for example, one last one. So when I was originally interviewed at Babson, my presentation was the first, do you know King Lear, the Shakespearean thing? Act one, scene one, which is a classic family business problem. Lear, so I'll just give you that. So I actually had the audience act it out. There's about 15 parts in it. It's a wonderful story on family business. Here's Lear. He's got this kingdom. He's been very, very successful. He's now going to have a family succession issue. And his question is, who loves me more? Because who gets the kingdom is, who loves me more? Not who's more competent to run it or who's really good at it, but do you love me? And as you know, the third daughter, who actually loves him more than any of the other two, says, if that's the criteria for succession, I'm out of the game. I'll see you. I'm going to France. Found a guy. Okay. There's furious. Okay. She doesn't get any of the kingdom. Succession plan falls apart. And you know, frankly, then it's an unraveling of the family business story. Two daughters take the kingdom. He thinks certain things are going to happen. He thinks he's still in charge. He's not. Misery. That's the tragedy of it. So it's a family business story. So, you know, there's lots of family business stories out there that I think we can really play with that kind of show these complications that oftentimes psychologists and sociologists can't really get a, a good witness on. Good. And with that, questions, comments? Yes, the floor, floor is, floor is yours. Questions, comments? Hold on, hold on, we need a, a microphone there. Hold on, it doesn't work. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Yeah, good. I, first of all, I thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. And I wanted to ask you if, from your studies, you have seen any cultural bias on the behavior of um, entrepreneurs. Because I imagine you made mo most of your studies in the, in the US. US. What about like different cultures? Huge. <laughs> Huge. The Let's see, how do I want to frame this answer? Culture makes a huge difference. So societal issues, cultural and institutional issues are vast. So, that, so I want to talk about that in relationship to the, um, the American way of starting businesses. It only, only makes sense in the United States, okay? It's not exportable in any way. I think one of the, so one of the problems that almost every country has is, is that they say, oh, Silicon Valley, isn't that great? We're making all these really cool companies. We want the same thing. And the answer is, Silicon Valley is not your answer in any way. It's a unique cultural form that exists only there. You can't even export it anywhere else. You can't export it anywhere else in the United States. 
because there are certain regional differences in terms of how people behave and interact in the United States that just will not make it work. So it's unique. It's not exportable. The Boston area is not exportable anywhere else. So every country and every city, every region has got to think about what are the ways we can enable this to happen and also what are the kinds of constraints that will prevent entrepreneurial activity from happening. Certainly some radical ones that make it very difficult to be entrepreneurial is so what is, what is Western European, Europe about? Fr frankly, it's about the rule of law. Laws matter. We care about how our legal structure prevents people from behaving badly. Okay. So that makes a huge difference because in our cultures, we don't put up with bribery, under the table payments. You know, we want things to be above board. We tend to reward meritocracies. That makes a big difference. A lot of cultures, that's not that way. But does it mean that there won't be entrepreneurship in cultures where there's lots of bribery and graft and all that? You can still be entrepreneurial, but it makes it more complicated. So yeah, culture makes a huge difference. And I think one of the nice things that's happened over the last 10 years in entrepreneurship is that we've had... So certainly the academic scholarship came out, in many ways, came out of the United States and Sweden. So one of the reasons I'm at Linus University is it has one of the oldest entrepreneurship programs in Europe. Okay. Bank Johannesson, I think, was probably one of the first professors in entrepreneurship there. So I kind of, in some ways, feel like I'm replacing him and, 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 and his footsteps. So um, there's certainly been a tradition of entrepreneurship research, particularly in Scandinavian countries. So you've had a long history of doing that. But the, the interest in entrepreneurship is now worldwide. Um, but entrepreneurship in Africa is very, very different than it is in the Middle East in Latin America, than in Asia. And that needs to be taken into account. And we're seeing a lot of that. So yes, I'm only speaking of the American experience. Okay, thank you. Thanks for an interesting lecture. Uh, Where are you? Here. Okay. <laughs> one I just of the heard sponsors the voice. Representing here's the voice. one of the sponsors here. Okay, so uh, I would like to, uh, elab uh, if you elaborate on two aspects of what your rule do, uh, do more. Because in, in many cases, my own experience and reading about research in entrepreneurship emphasizes the learning aspect. Being able to not run a development project, but a learning process, which in my view is completely different. And the other one is that when you go for an MBA and such an education, you usually learn about resource allocation and resource control. But in my view, entrepreneurship is much more about the ability to attract resources. Agreed. Rather than, than controlling and, and allocating resources you don't have. So if you could please elaborate uh, on those two aspects. Both. So the, uh, I would say if you're familiar with the lean startup movement, wh whether that would be um, Steve Blank's lean startup or Eric Ries' lean startup. Are most of you familiar with lean startup? Uh, so it's kind of a Silicon Valley thing again. The lean startup idea is, is that... Um, you build, out, you build up and build out as quickly as you can. You try to create a prototype or something that someone can interact with and give you feedback about. Okay, so the quicker, and the whole point of Lean Startup is the learning process. You need to get out to customers to find out what they really want. And pr prototyping, if you're familiar with IDEO, I-D-E-O, and um, that group out of, again, out of Silicon Valley, the Browns. Um, the whole idea is, you know, the, 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 Browns, the Browns motto is get physical fast. But if you have something to show as a prototype, then you can learn from others about whether it's doable or not and whether they want it or not. Eric Ries, who wrote the book Lean Startup, begins with a story. His story is, I had $54 million to spend on a website. It was going to do X, Y, and Z. We blew it all in designing a really cool website. We put it online and no one came and no one bought anything. So we lost $54 million. Duh. Maybe we should have made a really crappy website for $500,000 and found out what people really wanted and learn from that and then move forward. Okay. So yes, I think learning is really crucial because certainly I have, but see, here's a dilemma because this could be, this is two ways to talk about the same story. I can have an entrepreneur who says, I talked to a hundred people. Okay, and on the 99th, on the 100th one, I finally found the person who really wanted what I wanted to sell. Okay, so it's like 
Gee, maybe you need to persist 99 times in order to find a hundredth person who really wants what you want to buy. But then you can have someone who talked to a hundred people and they basically had the same conversation with a hundred people and learned nothing. Okay? And they'll never get to the person that will really buy their product because it's just the same old, same old. So learning's a key to it, but Again, it plays out in a weird way because, you know, I think uh, I'm going to drift. I'm going to drift and say this. Probably the most important thing that most entrepreneurs can learn is that what they're doing doesn't work and there's no way they can fix it, okay? I really believe in this 30% rule. So for, okay, so for example, I do a lot of painting and I do a lot of poetry and I read a lot of poetry and I look at a lot of paintings. If you've looked at, this is my view, if you look at most people who do paintings, even a world-class artist, let's say Van Gogh, are most of Van Gogh's paintings that great? 70% are crap, frankly. 30% are really, really good. My favorite poet is a poet, Wallace Stevens. He's written a boatload of poems. Only 30% are any good. The rest of them are really crappy, okay? They're awful to read, okay? And so I keep thinking, that's kind of my rule, rule in life is that only 30% of, of what you do is going to be any good. Which means the really smart people in the world know when to quit and say, oh, this is really crap. Or, you know, put it away. And then just move on to other stuff till they get to that 30% that's really good. So learning is really key. A lot of entrepreneurs don't learn at all. And the, again, what, what would be better? I, luck or learn? And, I, you know... And there's just a lot of people out there that are really lucky. I've got a lot of entrepreneur friends who are, I won't name any names, that are really stupid. That are just like, they're worth multi, multi millions of dollars. And it's like, they honestly are clueless about how they made all that money. They have no idea. I mean, really, if you just ask them, well, what's your business model? How does it work? I don't know. I kind of started to sell this and I made a lot of money from it. What's your margin? Well, I don't know, but you know, every day my bank account keeps getting bigger. <laughs> it's, so that's part of this problem is there's a, you know, in the unknowable future, it's really hard to predict who the winners and losers are going to be because most of it doesn't work. So even if you learn, you could learn that you're a loser. Okay? Yes. And that's okay. So it's a numbers game. So the learning thing I think is important, but not always. Um, and the other one was about Oh, I forgot your second point was a really good one. Resource oh, attraction. I think so. I think attracting, re again, it's being able to create a future that other people want to live in. And if they want to live in it, they'll give you money for it. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Now I'm asking a question. My question is about failure. You mentioned that a huge percentage of all entrepreneurial activities will end up in failure. Yes. Is there any point of studying those failure projects to study those entrepreneurs who failed? Because now it's mostly about successful stories. And what can we actually learn from those who failed? Thank you. You know, I've thought about that a lot and I've looked at failures and sometimes I'm not sure that we learn anything from them. It's like, um, Oh, I'm going to drift again. So, I'll have to give a soccer analogy. If I was in the U.S., I'd do baseball, which actually plays out as 30%. If you stand up at a plate, do you know what baseball is in the United States? Someone is at a mound. They throw a ball towards a catcher. There's someone in between called a hitter who has a chance to hit the ball with a bat. Okay. The likelihood that you're going to get a hit in the United States as a professional is 0.265. So, out of 100 times you stand at the plate, if you're a professional and you're any good, your average is 27 times you're going to actually get a hit. The rest of the time you don't get hits. Do you know what it is in soccer? If you're running down the field and you try to kick the ball to the net, what, this is why Americans find soccer so boring. What's the chance it'll actually get in the net when you kick it? You don't even know that. See, Americans do statistics on everything, so I can tell you, I know. The average for a professional soccer league in Europe, the likelihood the ball will get kicked into the net by a soccer player is one out of ten times. That's the average in professional play. The most successful soccer player who's ever played and has had the highest percentage, I think is Messier, 
and his percentage was 0.2, okay, which meant that two out of 10 times he got the ball into the net, which means, so what do we, so what do we learn from the eight times that he didn't get it in? I think kind of we learn more from how were things set up for the two times he got it in. But I'm not sure. I, you know, I've been looking at failures and successes. I've done industry studies where I've looked at everyone in an industry over time to see whether what makes a difference. It's complicated. Okay. That well, I can come down to, it comes to adaptive persistence. We're working, there. we'll get back to you, but we're working towards the back of the room. Yeah. Uh, my name is Robert and I'm an entrepreneur in finance. And uh, thank you for a very enlightening uh, presentation. <clears throat> I'm probably one of the lucky guys or the, the, the <laughs> stupid guys, I guess, because I don't know how, how I've got successful if, if, if that's what I am. But w my question is about serial entrepreneurs. So let's say you want to invest some of the money that you make uh, or, uh, well, on other people. So would, you, would you do that on uh, previously successful entrepreneurs or do they have a higher likelihood of succeeding than... Uh, let's say the normal person. I, I was very fond of your correlational data that you had. Um, the serial entrepreneurship thing is an interesting challenge. Part of it has to do with what your tacit knowledge is and how it can be applied in the kind of industries you're in. So if, if you're in finance, I would say you're going to have lots of clues about innovation in the finance area. I would probably, if I were you, not invest in restaurants. Okay. Or things that you're not that the, that the business model is not somewhat similar. So, so I'll give you so, an example of a serial entrepreneur that I, I think is probably one of the most successful ones in the United States, who's basically understood the nature of his business model and applied it to different industries. So, in the United States, so he starts, he starts this business in garbage, okay? He's in Chicago and he realizes that how the stock market works is that if you have increasing sales, you look like a high growth company. So he says to everyone around him, I'm going to start, I'm going to consolidate garbage trucks. Okay. So I'm going to buy garbage truck businesses. His financial engine was, I'm going to buy garbage truck businesses. Basically, if anyone buys them, they're usually five times earnings. I'm going to offer 10 times earnings. I'm a high growth company. I'll be valued at 50 times earnings. So anyone who sells to me, first of all, makes twice as much as they normally would. But as soon as I get my earnings, those immediately go up four, 40 times, four times. Okay, so he buys garbage truck businesses all the United States. It's a company called Waste Management. He's a fellow named Wayne Heisinga. He buys as many companies as he can. He realizes that there's no more to buy. He gets out. He's a billionaire. The management team gets in trouble because they need to manufacture earnings for growth. But now he looks for another industry to consolidate. That happens to be, at that point, videotape renting. And he starts a company called Blockbuster. Rides it up, same way. Buys all these videotape companies, gets to the top of the market, sells to Viacom, walks away, more billions, Viacom loses their shirt on that. And then he says, is there any other fragmented industries left? Automobile dealerships, Auto Nation. Buys automobile dealerships, takes that up as far as he can, sells that as well. So, you know, the business model that worked in different industries was he had a fragmented industry, tried to figure out ways to consolidate, be a growth company, knew how to play the Wall Street game. So if you've got a business model that can be transferable because of the dynamics of it, yes, but typically most serial entrepreneurs need to stay in what they know best. They use their tacit knowledge. Hit it on the wall. That always works. Well, there's a red light. Maybe I will. I'll press it hard. Okay, never, never mind. Uh, it's still a red light. Uh, Here. <laughs> we'll give you another one. Thank you. Hello. 
Hello. Hi. Uh, apologies for the intimation. Uh, my name is Adam and I work in this uh, mud cake called the Entrepreneurial Support System. And I guess every country has one or uh, at least the, the powers in charge want uh, some kind of support system. This support system in every country has its uh, pros and cons, its, draws, uh, its, uh, its flaws and its uh, good sides. Well, how? What would be your advice to a government or a power who would like to improve their support system for entrepreneurs? You already mentioned that education is, of course, of great importance. But apart from that, could you get to the details? Sure. In an analogous way. So I'm a huge baseball fan, so, but only theoretically. So. The big issue of what happened in baseball in the 50s was, is, was the beginning of the farm club system. A fellow named Branch Rickey who had a team called the Brooklyn Dodgers. And Branch Rickey's idea was from the many to the few. And the farm club system was millions of kids are playing baseball. Of some of those kids, you put them in a farm league where there's like triple A baseball. If they're good at triple A baseball, then they go to double A. Then from double A, they go to single A. And then from single A, then they go to the the big time, okay? So if I'm doing entrepreneurship societally from the many to the few, first of all, I think in certain aspects of entrepreneurship, it's non-predictive, which means that I think it's really hard to predict winners, okay? Because part of it is just luck and all kinds of other stuff. So there's kind of a weird process going on, but I would try to get as many people in the game as possible across all kinds of things and get so again if I would if I wanted a country to play well it's just like why are the Swedes good at golf because a lot of people play why are they good at tennis a lot of people play why are they good at music a lot of people sing and do music hello I mean if they're chopping wood then they'll be good wood choppers but if they're doing singing then they'll be good at it so you know my sense is you build you build arenas you build tennis courts if you want tennis players and so we just need arenas where things interact and things happen. But Claire is here to tell you more about how to do that later. But to me, at least at the beginning of it, you just need a lot of it. And then some of it will be good and some of it won't. I mean, how, wh why is your music industry so good? I think there's just lots of venues for playing, right? People sing and they do that. And something happens. They make a lot of money. Yes, sir. Maybe, maybe a little bit to catch up on that. My name is Mike. I'm from the Stockholm School of Economics. Um, on one side, you know, economy is about managing limited resources. So the question is, how can we basically really teach entrepreneurship? We have those business labs, then we have accelerators. Um, but in case you have a limited budget of, let's say, 100, how would you, you know, allocate this budget of 100 towards what? In order to be as successful as possible, to have the biggest output for the GDP from the students that you teach to go towards entrepreneurship. That was a kind of a research along comment. It's going to sound weird because I hate this word, but, but I think it's actually the answer. It's what we need to do in society is let people find their passion, okay? Because if people are actually doing what they want, then cool things happen. And we need to enable kind of passionate things to happen. Um, and so, so there's two issues, actually in society. There's, there's value creation and value appropriation. Okay, and so one of the challenges is that I think if people pursue their passion, they're going to create value to other people. I think that's possible in entrepreneurship. So we need to enable that to happen. But, but then the issue with society is, is that what societies need to be better at, Sweden's actually pretty good at it, is allocating the value that's created. Okay, who's going to get it? Okay, so for example, this is kind of the insanity of what happened to Denmark over the last five years. Denmark was taken over by economists, okay? That's what's ruined Denmark. Let's just send it to Copenhagen now when I go back. So for example, here's the insanity of what happens with the issue of creation and allocation. So in the Danish system, they were looking at, okay, so how is value created if you're a designer, for example? So, for example, one of the design schools, they did a study and found out that, for example, if you want your metric to be having a job nine months after graduation, well, designers don't get jobs for three years, okay? So, that was a bad metric. So, they said, well, okay, well, we still want to give them money. 
So let's look at lifetime value earnings of designers from this school compared to the rest of the population. What they found out was is that these designers actually over their lifetimes made le these were people with master's degrees, made less than someone with a high school education. So then you say, well, they're not creating any value because their own personal earnings are less than if they would have just not gone to school and us not paid to go to school. And they could have just been janitors. They'd have, done, they'd have been financially better off. But again, there's a creation of value and allocation. If you look at Denmark, all these designers are creating huge value for design-oriented firms. They go, to, go eventually to work for Royal Copenhagen. They just don't get the money from Royal Copenhagen. It goes to the corporation and to the shareholders and to other people. Think about this with architects. Architects create huge, they design buildings, right? Okay. Do they get most of the value that comes out of the genius of their architecture? No, they get a very little bit of it. So they create value. It's just allocated to the developers and other people. So I think this is part of the problem of is we don't pay attention to how value gets allocated to the people who actually create it. I mean, the sad example is, you know, Van Gogh, he got none of the value. I mean, what if, he, what if there was copyright laws that would kind of the Van Gogh foundation for every time the art piece of art was sold, it got 10%? It'd be a huge foundation, right? Yes, sir. Does it work? Yes. My name is Mats Bergqvist, and I was an entrepreneur, and now I'm active in venture capital. There are studies that have shown that Sweden is exceptionally outstandingly good compared to the rest of the world, compared to its size in creating entrepreneurial success, in particular unicorns. And you've partly given the answer what the reason is. There's probably a lot of people who want to be entrepreneurs around here. But now you've seen, you know, you said that your experience is based on US, but you've been here so much and you work in Veksha. What are the other handful or the other factors you think that have made our country so successful in entrepreneurship? I hope I'm not giving you a too tough question here. Well, no, because I've already said them. I think it is, I think, you know, you're a, you're a highly advanced Western democracy where everyone is really smart, and it makes a big difference, okay? So you're, that, I think, is really, really key. So you've got smart people. And there's more smart, because they're well-educated, they're more smart than other places, because uh, other places are less educated. So I think that's part of the issue. I think the other aspects are, Here is, here is how we're all going to fail in, the, in Western economies. I'm very curious about what's going on in China because in some ways, you know, our ability to use phones is about like half of what's going on in China. Okay. So they're just way beyond imagination in terms of apps and what they're doing with phones. It's scary. Um, even in Africa, in some ways, what the Africans are doing with their phones is way more innovative than we're doing. So... You know, part of it, I'd say, is, you know, a lot of innovation comes when people take technologies and pioneer in new and interesting ways. So we have some chances to do that, but I must say a lot of countries are... I, I just would not discount the Chinese in any way right now. So, yeah, and it's true. For such a small nation, unbelievable what's happened here. So, yes. Yes, it's a social system that works. I love to be here for that reason. Um, now, no, we don't have time. I want to have sorry, but if I have time for one. I want to have you comment on one thing. So, uh, from you are now going back to the, sort of the 20 years, or you're even more experienced in the research. But let's stay with the tw last 20 years. What are the two or three major achievements you think that the, the research and entrepreneurship have contributed to the development of entrepreneurship, if at all? To be a bit. Um. You know, for me, I think one of the things that's been pu pushed that's really important is, so my personal agenda was always to say that entrepreneurship is a process, not a characteristic. So entrepreneurship is about something that happens. It's a process and set of behaviors that people are engaged in. It's not about the person called the entrepreneur. It's about entrepreneurial processes and what people do. And if that's the case, then we don't look for special people. Okay. So, I mean, think about it. If our goal was to find Mozart, 
Wouldn't that, it's like, find, if you know the picture books, Where's Waldo? I mean, how would, we, how would you find Mozart? It's just like nuts. You can't do it. But if our job is to say, look, at, we want some of the best music and best composers in the world. How do we do that? Well, we just make sure that everyone plays a musical instrument, has musical training, and Mozart's going to show up. Okay? The really good ones go to the top. So, you know, to me, I think this is one of the things that we, I think the research has tried to push is not make entrepreneurship about individuals, but about processes and behaviors, so you can all learn it. Um, that, I think, has been a win, but also, certainly, again, the stories of success around the world for people that have been innovative. You know, in a weird way, that's always been the case across all cultures for a long period of time. You can go back in Sweden and name dozens of individuals that through the last hundred years have innovated in wonderful ways in this country and have been phenomenally successful. And you know, my sense is I think we've been better at celebrating those stories to say, here's a path for you to go forward. Here's a way you can be successful. And it's not, it's not impossible for you to be. Again, to me, it's like, it's not a unique thing. There's lots of ways to imagine and make, make, make the future possible. So I think that's where research is. And then certainly, I mean, this is just the most amazing thing I think to happen over the last 20 years. The, I mean, what do, you, what do we want to call this? A portable computer with telecommunicating device, you know, capabilities. Apple came out with this in 2007 with the apps and this whole ability to write software. But you know, the, the computers in this are more sophisticated than anything ex that existed actually in the 90s. Okay, this is more sophisticated than any computer I ever had. So th this, I think, has just opened up huge numbers of possibilities. I don't think we're even close to figuring out what the phone and telecommunications can, can do for the rest of the world. So yay for that. Technology has done some wonderful things. We'll, we'll see. We'll see all of the good in terms of where it takes us and probably all the bad as well. As you know, you can get all my credit card information. It just was downloaded illegally on Expedia. So every American's credit card, credit card information, you can buy it for a couple of dollars. Enjoy. I've had a cool life. You'll find out all about it. <laughs> on that note, thank you very much. OK. And, and thank you. Not on. Now I am on. Uh, sustainability is a big thing, and uh, a little memento from our today is uh, a bowl that is made of recyclable glass, and quite nice is also about education, as you said, because we also are through the, this supporting UNICEF's work in school in a box. It's a way to expand knowledge and knowledge dissemination. So thank you. Yay! Thanks. And should I say Fika next door? Th thank right you there. for coming, and uh, you'll get the invitation to the next Start Lectures soon. Thank you very much.